Hey there, this is Dr. Eric Pearson with Citizen Surgeon, where we help you gain the critical knowledge that you need to be comfortable in the OR, on the wards, and of course, to crush your exams. If you're new here, make sure you hit that subscribe button, hit the reminders tab, so you can be the first to know whenever we have new videos and new content coming out. Today, we're gonna to continue our discussion on the metabolic response to injury. And if you watched the last video, part one, we talked about pain, hypovolemia, and circulating stuff. And that's a really important prerequisite video to understand what's happening today when we talk about the metabolic changes that happen and how the body uses fuel. So if you haven't seen this yet, go ahead and click on the link, watch that video, and then you'll be ready for this one. To continue the discussion today, we're gonna to talk about three major things. And that is, first, the ebb, flow, and recovery phases of injury. Second, we're gonna be talking about the metabolic changes and the metabolites and how they're used following injury. And third, we're gonna talk about injury and fuel. As always, we're gonna ask the question, why? So why is it important to know about the metabolic changes in the body after injury and how those metabolites are used? Well, you can ask yourself a couple of questions. So why is it beneficial to give your patient a little bit of dextrose perioperatively? What does that do? Why is the knowledge of a nutritional strategy so important? And why do you have to know this stuff when it comes to changing the content of your TPN in that critically ill patient? Well, today you're gonna to have the building blocks to be able to answer those whys. It's important for you to know how the body utilizes its fuel after injury and trauma and even elective surgery so that you can develop an appropriate nutritional strategy. For example, you may not wanna to give too much dextrose to that critically ill patient who is at risk of developing hepatic steatosis beyond a certain limit. You'll want to understand, like we just talked about, that delivering a small amount of sugar in the perioperative period limits proteolysis and ultimately limits skeletal muscle loss so that you can have a more effective recovery and get back to baseline. Knowing how to have a nutritional strategy and what that background is, is going to help you improve your surgical outcomes and hopefully decrease morbidity and mortality in your patients. So first, ebb, flow, and recovery. Think of the metabolic response to injury like the tides. There's an ebb, a flow, and a steady state, that recovery. Immediately after injury, we have the ebb phase, and that's shutdown mode, that is preservation mode. This occurs in the first minutes to hours following injury. And that's where you can see that the beach is out, the tide is out, nothing's happening, it's kind of shut down, all right? The next phase is the flow phase. And here you can see the water rapidly coming into the bay. And that's where, as we talked about in the last video, after injury, you have that stimulation of the pain. Pain is gonna stimulate your baroreceptors and your chemoreceptors to, to secrete catecholamines. Norepinephrine and epinephrine are gonna have their effects. Pain, anxiety, and fear is also gonna stimulate CRH release from the hypothalamus. That's gonna to go to the anterior pituitary. You're gonna get ACTH release. That's gonna to lead to cortisol release from your adrenal glands and then all the downstream activity of cortisol. You're also gonna have aldosterone and ADH release for volume preservation. So all of these things are happening in the flow phase and that's where the water's coming back in. Finally, in the recovery phase, the boats are sailing. Everything is good. This is the anabolic state. This is the only state where you can actually have protein synthesis and rebuilding of that skeletal muscle that you lost or your patients lost. So let's get further on into each of these phases. The ebb phase or shock occurs in the first hours and minutes following an injury and severe trauma. As you can see here, there are a number of changes activation of the sympathetic system, the catecholamines and release of cortisol leads to glycogenolysis and increase in your glucose levels. This also leads to decreased insulin secretion, insulin resistance, and increased free fatty acids by lipolysis. 
all to create more energy for that flow phase which is about to come. In the flow phase, you have increased substrate utilization, increased cardiac output, and increase in your metabolic rate. As fat is the preferred energy during trauma, the preferred metabolite, you're gonna have further increase in your free fatty acids. Amino acids are going to be liberated from the skeletal muscle to produce the acute phase proteins, and there is gonna be a negative nitrogen balance as you have increased nitrogen excretion through the urine, and we've seen that metabolism can increase 15 to 30% during this flow phase. The transition from the flow phase to recovery happens within three to eight days after elective surgery and much longer after major trauma, sepsis, and injury. This is also known as the corticoid withdrawal phase, and this is where you begin to get a cessation of that proteolysis or breakdown of protein from skeletal muscle and an increase in protein synthesis or rebuilding. This phase also coincides with the diuretic phase as you have increased oral intake and decreased ADH and aldosterone leading to a diuresis because the body is no longer in that flight or fight response, that all or none response where it needs to hold on to its volume. Now it's giving that up as aldosterone, ADH, renin, angiotensin II, all of those hormones begin to decrease, decrease circulating stuff and an increased return back to the normal state. So now we'll move on to the specific metabolites. And we have to ask that question, why again? Well, why is it important to know this? Well, it's important to know it so you can develop an appropriate nutritional strategy that takes into account what's happening to lipids, proteins, and carbohydrates after trauma and injury. In the elective setting, that could be as simple, sometimes complicated, but as simple as limiting preoperative fasting and giving a preoperative carbohydrate drink in an ERAS program or enhanced recovery after surgery so that you can limit that proteolysis and have better glycemic control. On the other end of the spectrum, this may be more complicated, like writing TPN for a multi-system trauma patient who's in their second week in the critical care unit and you're curious where they are at in their caloric needs, where they are at in the flow phase, have they gone to that anabolic recovery phase yet? So let's talk about protein first. First is that protein serves as the greatest glucose substrate following injury. Now I didn't say the biggest fuel, I said the greatest precursor to glucose, precursor to gluconeogenesis. We know that surgical stress leads to increased protein breakdown, and that proteolysis leads to increased nitrogen excretion in the urine as we build our acute phase proteins in the liver. Now this response is proportional to the injury, and if we think about it, the amount of protein breakdown can be up to 30 grams of nitrogen a day secreted in the urine, that's equivalent to 1.5% or about 1.5% loss of lean body mass a day or up to a kilo of skeletal muscle broken down every day. Understanding this makes it clear that without nutritional support, which can suppress but not completely eliminate protein breakdown, skeletal muscle loss can be rapid. And in addition, that will lead to not having the muscular strength to wean from the ventilator. Protein degradation happens really quickly. And studies have shown that even within hours of elective surgery, you get complete blockade of protein synthesis and increased proteolysis. So that's within hours of an elective surgery. In this case, typically the solid organs like your liver and kidney are preserved while you have loss of primarily skeletal muscle to provide those amino acids as the precursor to glucose. So remember that gluconeogenesis, those were like those nightmare pathways from your first year as a medical student. Maybe you are a first year medical student, so you, you, you're dealing with all those pathways right now. But basically in gluconeogenesis, the synthesis of glucose from non-glucose precursors and lactate, glycerol, and amino acids serve as basically all of the carbons you need that are circulating in the plasma. And so if I was to ask you what organs gluconeogenesis happens in, what would you say? And why is it those organs? So remember, and this is really into biochemistry, but remember that most tissues lack 
glucose 6-phosphatase in order to enter the gluconeogenic cycle. And so the organs that have those are liver and kidney, and that's why they are the primarily the gluconeogenic organ. So moving on to lipids, remember that lipids are the primary fuel after trauma and injury. And this is especially the liver. But why do lipids produce so much energy? Can you remember? When we look at the amount of energy per gram of metabolite, so the amount of calories per gram of protein, per gram of carbohydrates, per gram of fat, remember that protein for every gram of that, you get four kilocalories. Every gram of carbohydrate gets you four calories and uh, every gram of fat gives you nine calories. Well, why is that? So again, going back to biochemistry, and this does have utility as a surgeon, but when we go back and we look at what is a triglyceride, so remember that a triglyceride is three fatty acids hooked up to a glycerol. And each of those fatty acids can have more than 16 carbons on it. For example, linolenic acid is an 18 carbon chain. And so those triglycerides, when we need to break them down for energy, are broken down in the cytoplasm into their fatty acids and glycerol. The fatty acids go through the carnitine shuttle to get into the mitochondria, and that's where fatty acid oxidation occurs, creating acetyl-CoA, which is gonna go into the Krebs cycle and produce a bunch of ATP. All of those carbons are gonna produce ATP. In addition, the glycerol directly enters glycolysis, so that's a lot of ATP production per triglyceride. So you, you probably didn't ever think that would come in handy, right? But it gives you the understanding of why fat is such an awesome resource in trauma and injury. So the stress response we keep talking about where you have increased ACTH, increased cortisol, that all leads to lipolysis, breaking down those triglycerides and increasing your fatty acids uh, that are circulating throughout the body. One thing to keep in mind is that with all of this triglyceride breakdown into fatty acids, you're creating so much energy that you don't need any more. And that's why, and we'll talk about this in the next video, is that we're, when you're giving dextrose in your TPN, you can give too much. And if you give too much, you can have overload and that'll lead to hepatic steatosis. The last metabolite to talk about is carbohydrates. In these have a high utility, but they can also be dangerous. And the carbohydrate that's most important to us is glucose. I keep saying again and again, the inflammatory response, the metabolic response to injury is to increase glucose. We are glucose burning machines during the normal state. But during trauma and injury, this all changes. We're fat burning machines. Starvation is a little bit different than stress because we preferentially break down protein and that serves as our precursors to glucose to provide energy. One of the purposes of an ERAS program in elective surgery is to limit that protein breakdown by limiting overnight fasting, giving somebody a preoperative carbohydrate drink, and limiting that proteolysis and inhibition of protein synthesis. And so we know that just giving 50 grams of dextrose a day, so that's just a one liter bag of D5 solution, D5 half an S has 50 grams of dextrose, that's enough to limit proteolysis, increase fatty acid oxidation, and reduce ketogenesis. But trauma, sepsis, and injury, totally different than starvation. And it's totally different because in the last video you learned that it's not just ha not consuming the energy for use, you have a massive release of pro-inflammatory hormones and cytokines that change everything. Early in the ebb phase, glycogen is broken down so that you can use glucose, but this only happens for 12 to 24 hours. Following that, you rely on renal and hepatic gluconeogenesis using amino acid precursors, as well as lactate, pyruvate, and glycerol. And so this increased synthesis of glucose is critical so that you can deliver glucose to cells which do not use insulin for uptake. So those cells are neurons, uh, red blood cells, leukocytes, inflammatory cells in the wound like fibroblasts, and granulation tissue. So they all use glucose directly. And that's why we need more glucose after injury so we can feed all of these cells. 
Lactate is also a very important precursor to glucose and this biochemically you'll bring back to the Cori cycle and that's how we shuttle lactate to glucose from peripheral tissues to the liver. But know that producing glucose here comes at a loss and it's a cost of four ATP for every glucose that you produce. So we talked about the fact that during injury and trauma, giving a small amount of glucose, you know, 50 grams a day, perhaps more if you're writing for TPN, but a small amount of glucose suppresses proteolysis, increases fat acid oxidation, decreases ketogenesis, and those are the benefits. But the cost is that too much glucose leads to hepatic steatosis. It also leads to excess carbon dioxide production, which leads to suboptimal pulmonary function. And so we can't talk about carbohydrate utilization or metabolites in general without talking about our good friend insulin. So in the normal state, insulin is secreted from the beta cells of the pancreas, the isolates of Langerhans, and this leads to quick uptake of glucose through the receptors, one of these, the GLUT4 receptor in the peripheral tissues. Insulin reduces muscle protein breakdown, it stimulates lipogenesis, and prevents lipolysis. Now take the stressed state. In the stressed state, glucagon, catecholamines, cortisol, growth hormone, and cytokines are all released, and that leads to increased free fatty acids and amino acids in the bloodstream but it suppresses insulin secretion and eventually creates insulin resistance. This resultant hyperglycemia leads to a pro-inflammatory response. And as endogenous insulin is not being produced, it's important that you give exogenous insulin so that you can return glucose levels to the normal state. And this leads to improved surgical outcomes and reduced morbidity. When we put everything together, we have injury, the endocrine response, and stress. When we put everything together, we have tissue injury, the endocrine response, and stress. Tissue injury leads to pro-inflammatory cytokines, and these lead to many things, including hepatic and peripheral insulin resistance, as well as glycogenolysis, proteolysis, and gluconeogenesis. You can refer to the last video to see exactly what cytokines are responsible for what actions. The endocrine response of injury starts with CRH followed by ACTH and cortisol, which leads to several downstream effects, including gluconeogenesis, glycogenolysis, and peripheral lipolysis. Finally, stress contributes to the hypermetabolic response through catecholamines with loss of skeletal muscle mass. All of these processes are interdependent in the inflammatory response. To summarize, the metabolic response to injury includes an ebb, flow, and recovery. Think of it like the tides. The inflammatory response leads to proteolysis, which can be severe, leading to significant losses of lean body mass and skeletal muscle. Lipids are the primary fuel for the body during trauma, including oxidation of fatty acids. Carbohydrates in the form of glucose are fuel for the peripheral cells, the inflammatory cells, and the cells of the wound. And finally, insulin, that really important hormone, is suppressed and its effects are blunted by the inflammatory response leading to hyperglycemia. So I really hope you enjoyed this review, this video today on the metabolic response to injury. Make sure to subscribe, hit those notifications so we can get you those videos when they come out. Next, I'm gonna be talking about surgical nutrition. And before you go, I wanted to hook you up with one clinical scenario to think about before the next video. So let's say you have a 17 year old boy who's a victim of multiple gunshots to the abdomen requiring resuscitation and damage control surgery. He is admitted to the ICU with an open abdomen and the bowel is left in discontinuity. This was damage control. Can you discuss the metabolic response to his injury? What is going on? And now, what is your nutritional strategy for this patient? Are you gonna use enteral feeds? Are you gonna start peripheral parenteral nutrition? Are you gonna go straight to total parenteral nutrition? What are the risks and benefits of each of those options? We're gonna talk about this next time. All right, so long.